Hi, I'm Larry Steed and today I'm going to be teaching Level Up writing better short stories. Uh, we'll be taking in key elements of the short story, including strong beginnings and endings, the creation of complex and engaging characters, the importance of editing, and the need for sensory data to anchor the narrative. While we won't have time to explore all, all the areas involved in creating quality fiction, we will examine these five more important ones in fair detail, and in so doing, I hope to help you take the stories to the next level. As for me, I'm Larry Steed. I'm the author of You Belong Here and the editor of Shibboleth and Other Stories. Uh, I'm also a manuscript assessor, a reviewer, an editor, sort of a one-size-fits-all uh, writer and writing teacher. Uh, so why I teach these workshops is that having been on the other side of the submissions process for competitions and publications, I'm aware of the level that needs to be executed for a piece of writing to get somewhere. And so as a teacher, I want to empower you to be able to do this with your own work and thus find greater success in the industry. So why might you want to enter a short story competition? Well, I guess the immediate uh, one would be to win, and that's not a bad goal as far as these things go. Um, obviously these things are somewhat up to the fates um, and so it's always worth just stretching oneself as a writer and aiming to get one piece as polished as possible. Uh, other reasons you might want to enter are uh, the community. So in my three year involvement with the Armadale Writers Award, I've found that probably my favourite time is when the award is announced and there's this group of people in the room and we're all celebrating that journey so far. So competitions are a great space in which you can stretch yourself as a writer and see where you're at as a writer and areas in which you want to improve going forward. So let's begin. Uh, areas in which a story can be improved. Uh, let's start with the beginning of your story. So a beginning is an introduction to your fictional world and as such it should establish the scene, the tone and also a chief protagonist. It should also, if possible, pique the interest of the reader to hook them in, so to speak. And how do we do this in practice? By the use of contrast, juxtaposition, and the subjugation of reader expectations. So more specifically, a great beginning often advances either the tone or the character, and at times sets up an intriguing plot premise. So let's look at some examples. Uh, this story is Speak To Me by Patty O'Reilly. Not all fantasy writers are geeks, I tell my friend. Most of us are normal people who like a good story with heroes and villains and right and wrong. We love to weave new worlds, grapple with strange physical laws we have created, and test the fabric of our new world for consistency. There is a single story in fantasy, I tell them, and it is the hero's journey, where ordinary people become extraordinary. It teaches us that every person has hidden talents, that we are stronger and more able than we know and that one person can make a difference in the world. This is what I hoped I would find in myself one day. I was typing on my computer in the dawn hours while the rest of the neighbourhood slept. An object the size of a thermos threw past my window, bounced like a football and rolled into the yard. I switched on the yard light and ran outside. I stood there, astonished, afraid, staring at the creature lying stunned beside its craft which glowed white hot before fading to grey and slowly crumbling to ash. When the ash had cooled, I bent over and took the limp creature into my hands. So that's an intriguing premise of work. Uh, let's look at Wayne Macaulay's Wilson's Friends as well and some interesting things we'll learn about character at quick speed. Wilson's Friends. One fine day, in early spring, by accident or design, a schoolboy who was working Saturday mornings in a supermarket pricing canned goods got a $2.25 pricing sticker stuck to the sleeve of his shirt and headed off home after work without realising. On the tram, the man opposite asked was he for sale, and the schoolboy, for a joke, said that he was. The man gave him $2.50, the schoolboy gave him 25 cents change, and the man took him home to his house, which was not very far away. One thing you'll notice with most of these short stories too is how much they do in such a short time. So what we're doing is we're establishing character, setting, and often the key conflict that will propel the story forward. And the final story is Cream Reaper by Julie Coe from her collection, Portable Curiosities. 
I've spent just five minutes in the presence of the man known as Bartholomew G, and I'm already convinced he's a special kind of genius. The famous allure of this titan ice creamer is hard to deny. Forget the Romans. This suave 34-year-old is the new man of modern empire, the greatest food revolutionary of his generation, a self-described food futurist slash visionary educationist who has Sydney in the grip of a deluxe ice cream pandemic. So far, his empire stands at five ice dealerships, whipping up frenzies in Alexandria, Surrey Hills, Bondi, Darlinghurst, and the Star. So what do openings do? They grab our attention in a great short story. There's the ability to rip one reader out of their space of level and take them into a place of conflict or a place of a new kind of character. Um, the landscape's really bare and up to us how we mould it and do something different with it. But hopefully you'll get the idea that in the beginning you're really looking to seize the reader's attention and to distinguish your voice and your style from all those styles, all those voices and all those stories that have come before. So if you wanted an exercise to try with that, write three new openings to a story. Each one should be at least a paragraph long. And in each of those openings, choose one thing to focus on. So for the first one, focus on character, say, and establishing the character. And maybe in the second one, you can establish a tone, the tone of voice. You'll notice in Julie Coe's story, there's a particularly sort of fanatical tone of voice coming through that's really interesting. And finally, you might just want to find the unique premise from which to begin your story. It's worth bearing in mind here that uh, short stories in particular often start at the point of conflict. So one of the most common things I find in uh, a short story that's being worked on is that it begins too early. And so we get what would traditionally be the setup in, say, a novel. But in fact, you can start a lot later with a short story. You can start with activity, with action, and that catalyst that's about to come into the fiction. So if a beginning pulls you in, then an ending should push you out with force. It's fair to say that a good ending should have a punch, or at the very least, solid closure of that character in that place in that time. This particular punch doesn't need to be negative. More important is the willingness to give the story the only ending it could really have. And if an ending doesn't feel right at any point in the development, then it's probably not. So with that in mind, be prepared to go deep into your character to find the appropriate way to close out your story. How we know the appropriate way to close out the story is as much to do with character as anything else. So if early on in our beginning we've established the stakes for the character or the things that the character has to lose, then we'll be aware of the narrative arc of the character going through as to where they need to get to by that story's end. It's worth noting with endings too that a short story ending doesn't need to be as complete and as resolved as a novel ending, uh, what really matters is that the narrative arc has come to the point of closure and that we finish the story as close as possible to that point of closure so as not to lead the reader on into uh, unnecessary information. I'll give you a couple of examples here as well and hopefully that will give you an idea of the kind of thing we can do with a short story. Uh, this is The Balloon by Donald Barthelmay and The Balloon's a really interesting story about unsurprisingly a balloon. Uh, but what Bartholomew does right at the end is he switches it from the kind of macro level of what the balloon's been doing in this town and takes it into the micro or the personal. So this is his final paragraph. I met you under the balloon on the occasion of your return from Norway. You asked if it was mine. I said it was. The balloon, I said, is a spontaneous autobiographical disclosure having to do with the unease I felt at your absence and with sexual deprivation. But now that your visit to Bergen has been terminated, it's no longer necessary or appropriate. Removal of the balloon was easy. Trailer trucks carried away the depleted fabric, which is now stored in West Virginia, awaiting some other time of unhappiness, some time, perhaps, when we are angry with one another. The other interesting thing you can do with an ending is, in addition to taking it from the macro to the micro, uh, you can also travel time, which is a fun thing to do, as Jhumpa Lahiri does in her particular story, The Third and Final Continent. So The Third and Final Continent is about a man really revisiting his entire life and having children and a wife and 
this journey that he goes on. But then right at the end, he does something very interesting with time, or she does, the author. And I'll read it now. In my son's eyes, I see the ambition that had first hurled me across the world. In a few years, he will graduate and pave his own way, alone and unprotected. But I remind myself that he has a father who is still living, a mother who is happy and strong. Whenever he's discouraged, I tell him that if I can survive on three continents, then there is no obstacle he cannot conquer. While the astronauts, heroes forever, spent my hours on the moon, I've remained in this new world for nearly 30 years. I know my achievement is quite ordinary. I'm not the only man to seek his fortune far from home, and certainly I'm not the first. Still, there are times when I'm bewildered by each mile I have traveled, each meal I have eaten, each person I have known, each room in which I have slept. As ordinary as it all appears, there are times when it's beyond my imagination. So ending is a uh, is something we need to sort of sit upon and often it can either be the first thing that comes in the revision of a story or the last thing. And knowing when to end a story becomes an acquired art over time. I would always encourage one to, I guess, seek the thematic context of the story to seek for your ending. Um, obviously the plot will propel your story to a point and yet the character's journey will be tied into both their narrative arc and the theme that's at play. So for an exercise here, I'd encourage you to write three different endings for a story, uh, with each one showing how your main character has been changed or not, depending on the case, by the action in the story. And I want you to think about what's resolved and what's left unanswered with each ending. It's possible that a story might leave a question unanswered, but then that might be the point of that particular story. And ultimately what you need to do with each one of these three endings that you write is think about what needs to happen to your character emotionally by that story's end. So that will be different for different characters. Um, remember Kurt Vonnegut's quote also that every character must want something even if it's only a glass of water. So one person's great trial is another person's trivia. So what's really important is to know your characters back to front so you'll know how to end your story. And so it's convenient then that we move on to character. Um, so obviously a character in a fictional setting in your short story will be made up of direct and indirect modes of character presentation. And these are as follows. Your direct methods of character presentation are dialogue, appearance, action, and thought. And your indirect methods are authorial interpretation or interpretation by another character. So authorial interpretation is your narrator, interpretation by another character, obviously another character within the text. So character then is a combination of the external appearance and these internal signifiers such as the thoughts and the way they speak, but also their behavior towards other characters within the fiction. As to how this works in practice, I'll give you another example, which is love by Josephine Rowe from her book, How a Moth Becomes a Boat. This is love. He is teaching her how to break bottles against the side of the house. A whiskey bottle works best, he tells her. She thinks this is very lucky because that is what they have the most of. He spent the last few weeks emptying them. So whiskey bottles are what they are using. Now, he says, like this, crack so that you get something like a shiv, not just a fistful of glass and stitches. Like this, he says, crack. And she feels a great swell of pride in his barrowy chest. He gets it perfect, every time. Now you, he says, and he hands her the next bottle. Because the father can't always be there, he says. And she nods and tries to look solemn, to make him believe she understands. The bottle does not break on first try. She swings harder on her second try and gets it, but it's a bad break. Her father does not say this, but she knows. Too close to the neck. Shards of glass from other afternoons shine dully in the dry earth at their feet. He hands her another bottle and the second break is better, the glass jutting out like the snaggled teeth of some prehistoric fish. She tries to imagine when she will need this, how things will ever get so bad. Her idea of evil is a slinking, unknowable thing, formless and weightless and impossible to her. She takes another bottle and tries to give the evil a shape, eyes and lips and things, all squinty and snaring, a 
composite of all the villains and monsters she's seen in films and picture books. And although she finds the result is less terrifying than something corporeal, she does not know how she will ever be brave enough. Will she ever be able to do that to somebody, evil or otherwise? They both know she will not. Later, there will be men and dark rooms and lost hours, a thousand little cruelties, and she will never, not once in her life, save herself in the way she does now. But there are so few things he feels he can teach her, so little he can offer before the night calls him back, swallows him whole without leaving any trace but the small change on his bedside table, half a pack of cigarettes and a new bruise on her mother's arm. But that is not important now. That is for later, and for now there is the smooth neck of the Jameson's bottle in her small hand, the cool glass warming with the heat of her palm, another crack against the wall of their coffee brick house. On the other side of the wall, her mother stands in the centre of the lounge room and listens, not understanding, her pale hands making light fists and her head lowered in preemptive defeat. Outside, the setting sun has turned her father to a featureless silhouette somewhere just to the right of her watching. When she tries to retrieve this moment from the clutter of early childhood, and she will, over and over again, looking for reasons, warning signs, answers, she will not remember how his face was set, but she will remember the sound of breaking glass, and she will understand this as love. So what's interesting with character is that we often learn as much about the character that's being observed as the character observing, so it's a very much a um, connected space, an interconnected space, character depiction, character generation, and that what one person believes will often refract onto another character within that space. The other thing that's worth remembering when it comes to character is that we need to be steering away from caricature and stereotype within the space. So the space for literary fiction and often the space of short story competitions is one that rewards endeavour and courage in terms of the types of characters that we create. Um, as competition judges, I myself will have read roughly a thousand stories each year, so there are certain types of characters that recur and repeat. And so what we're looking for is a fully complex character. Amy Tan calls this the ambiguity of creativity. We're not necessarily there as writers to overtly judge the characters. What we're there to do is to present the character and let the reader make their own meaning from that particular situation. Uh, moving on from character is this idea of sensory data. And sensory data is really how we bring a character to life. So my former teacher Zizi Packer puts it thus, if you can't see it, hear it, touch it, taste it, and smell it, then it really doesn't exist. And um, this goes for character, but it also goes for setting and anything that's sort of on the stage of your short story. Most common in a short story is visual depiction of things, so people are often very good at creating the visual landscape of a particular story, but they miss out on these other four senses. And sound's a very powerful one, but so is smell. Um, and you can really work through all five of them. So if we look at, for example, say a uh, cold soft drink on a particular day, you might know that the glass is sweating because it's a hot day, but you also might know the sound of the ice clinking against the glass, um, that light fizz when one shifts the ice cubes around, uh, and the bubbles that drift up to the surface. If it's a, say, a diet soft drink, you might even notice a faint chemical whiff coming off of the drink. Um, and the hands themselves will feel the cold coming through from the glass. So as writers, this is really our sort of virtual reality chamber. We step in and we need to own all those five sensory spaces because without that, you run the risk of your story being flat or one dimensional. So the ex exercise here is actually quite simple and it's really just to take or to make a scene uh, in a particular location with a particular character and you want to expand it using all your five senses. Where possible, stretch not for these adjectives, so often people say his hands were clammy, um, but what you're really doing is stretching for verbs and nouns um, and where appropriate a simile or a metaphor. We call this process activation, so if a particular noun, say a tree, in a landscape if a tree is tall, that's fine, but it doesn't create the same visual image as if the tree towers over the particular character. So this is called activation. 
And finally, in this cocktail of uh, creating as compelling fiction as we possibly can, is this idea of editing and revision. The bad news is that editing and revision is roughly about as much fun as dental work, but it is a necessary evil within uh, the creative writing space to ensure that our work is executing fully and also to ensure the depth of character, the depth of story, the depth of theme that will get a story picked up for publication or I guess recognised within a competitive space. So. Obviously the first sort of little tip in this one is that a first draft is not a short story, it's a draft of a story. Uh, and so what we need to do then is go into a space of revision and editing with all that. Initially I'd encourage the writer to do that on their own for at least the first few drafts so that they get a feel for their work. Um, as another challenge emerging writers sometimes face is sharing their work a little too early. And that can be quite damaging for one's writing confidence, but also for the organic flow of the story. Because if you show your work to someone at any point, they will always have an opinion. Ideally, you want to have your story as fully full as possible before that happens, so that you can make a decision on whether what they're saying has merit or not. Um, obviously, editing is really just it's a combination of two key activities and one is the expansion of the story to form its natural sort of arc and the other is the reduction of unnecessary sentences, any words that don't particularly fit in and it's also the interrogation of your story on a word by word basis so saying does this word do what it's supposed to do so another of my old teachers Deborah Robertson used to say that when you're going through a story in revision you start paragraph by paragraph and then you move into sentence by sentence and then you know you're getting close when you're starting to go by every single word as it's happening. Uh, in terms of thematic coherence, what you are looking out for in the revision process as well are digressions or things that don't add to the overall flow of the narrative. So story is a space of convergence and so anything that feels like an outlier most likely is if it doesn't resonate back within the story as a whole. Um, in terms of how that might look you can think about, about your protagonist's conflict, say act one of a short story, the crisis which is around about act two and then the resolution which comes through sort of end of act two very briefly in act three. I'll reiterate again that a resolution might not be as complete or as full in a short story versus say a novel. The other interesting thing to think about is what uh, my old teachers easy used to call uh oh, aha uh -huh, and oh no moments. And really what she's talking about there is foreshadowing which is the uh oh moments. Um, the aha uh -huh is the realisation and the oh no or the oh yes moment if it's a positive story is the culmination of what's been sowed so far in the story. So foreshadowing, we haven't really talked about yet, but essentially it ties into Chekhov's gun idea, which is that if a gun shows up in the mantle in Act 1, then it had better go off in Act 2 or Act 3. So what we're doing with foreshadowing, and particularly in the revision process, is we're saying what is in my first one to two paragraphs that will echo back in the story's ending and thus find a more rewarding process for our reader. So obviously we're talking here about a particular writing award and so what's really important as the process of submission is to go through what I've discussed thus far in the work as a kind of a checklist um, as to ensuring we've done things right. So we cover the beginning and the ending and they're interrelated as to how they work with each other and then there's of course this character and the character's narrative arc will play out within the beginning, the ending and throughout the story. This idea of conflict, crisis and resolution which we talked about earlier. Uh, in terms of sensory data, I believe this is one space where you can really accelerate your writing and so as a competition judge and an editor I would say that getting your sensory data down, this is writing in, you know, if you can't see it, taste it, touch it, hear it and smell it, if you include this sort of data in your work, things start to get a lot more immersive and so your fiction starts to rise up above, say, the top 
or the bottom 80% of submissions. And so if there's one thing in common with those bottom 80%, it's that they're not bad stories, but they're not fully realized. And so there's a flatness of character or a flatness of setting, or there's just not the depth that creates something like life. So sensory data is very important in that. And the other big kicker prior to submission is ensuring that your editing and that your vision is first rate. So you're reading your work out loud, you're looking through it line by line and seeking anything that's superfluous to the key message of what your story is about. Um, it's okay to be gentle with that process at first. It's okay also to get guidance from something like Grammarly, which can be integrated into Microsoft Word to start your journey on grammar and punctuation as a part of creating a solid, inclusive and immersive story. Uh, if the deadline is coming up and things don't seem to be working the way you'd like them to, it's also okay to wait. Uh, obviously I'm speaking for the Armadale Writers Award, so we'd love it if you can get your story as polished as you can and then submit it. We'd love to see your entry. Um, with all that in mind though, writing is a marathon, it's not a sprint. And so what's really important is that you put your best work forward as a matter of course, time and time again. And so over time what happens is you get very proud about your work and you lose that initial rush of wanting to get the, oh my God, you're amazing kind of rush and more the confidence that you've executed to a strong level and you, and you can present your work with pride and hopefully it can be accepted, given uh, recognition. If it doesn't, it doesn't mean you're not executing at a high quality level. Okay, so what does this look like uh, if we manage to control our, end, our beginning, our ending, our character and our sensory data and we ensure that the story is adequately edited and revised. Well, I'd like you to look at a particular story which is Dance in America by Laurie Moore from the book Birds of America. Uh, I won't read that uh, at this particular time but what we will do is provide a link to the full text uh, in the description and from here um, we'll go on and we'll talk a little more about how the story executes and hopefully that'll help you flesh out how that might look in your own story as you go through revisions. Welcome back. Okay, so we've worked our way through the story Dance in America by Laurie Moore and the things we were looking at as we worked through the story were the beginning, what the beginning established for your reader, the ending, how the ending achieved its goal of closure for the story and the techniques that Laurie Moore used, uh, the character. So that's how we perceive the narrator at the start of the story versus how we perceive her at the end and if there's any change there. The other thing I wanted you to do was, as you read this story, uh, keep an eye out for these sensory images using all, all manner of the senses, so that's sight, sound, touch, taste or smell, and really charting the different types of sensory information she embeds in that story. And then finally, we ask these questions about editing and revision, and that's how long is the story? Could it be any shorter? Or were there any scenes or phrases that seems unnecessary? So let's talk through it. This is the beginning. I tell them dance begins when a moment of hurt combines with a moment of boredom. I tell them it's the body reaching, bringing air to itself. I tell them that it's the heart's triumph, the victory speech of the feet, the refinement of animal lunge and flight, the purest metaphor of tribe and self. It's life, flipping death the bird. So here we have our protagonist. We know the profession, which is dance, and we can kind of see that the type of character that they are, which is passionate and in search of fulfillment. The great irony here is that um, in the very next paragraph she'll say that I'm kind of, she's making this up as she goes along. So that subverts that, but for now this is what we have in the first paragraph. So the interesting thing also to note in this first paragraph is that final sentence, which is, seems somewhat innocuous where she states that it's dances like life, flipping death the bird. And this foreshadows the ending as early as the very first paragraph, which is an incredibly clever thing to do. Let's move on to the ending. This is how we offer ourselves, enter heaven, enter speaking. We say with motion and space, this is what life's done so far down here. This is all and what and everything it's managed. This body, these bodies, that body. So what do you think heaven? What do you fucking think? Stand next to me, I say, and Eugene does, looking up at me with his orange warrior face. We step in place, knees up, knees down, knees up, knees down, dip, glide, slide, dip, glide, slide. This is it. 
this is it. Then we go wild and fling our limbs to the sky. And so throughout Birds of America, there's this, or should I say Dance in America, the story, more stresses the various deaths of these characters that aren't literal deaths. So there's an emotional death, a letting go of things. And yet we're really faced with Eugene's biggest challenge, which is cystic fibrosis and the potential of death down the road for him. And the ending gives us this strange sense of resilience, defiance and hope in this idea that they can dance in the face of death. And um, here we find life flipping death the bird, as she foreshadows in the first paragraph. Although I'd argue it's in a way that we hadn't expected going in. Um, and so she beautifully brings together the narrator and Eugene and the story is both about her and it's also about him. And it's cleverly enough about her that it doesn't become a sort of dewy-eyed sentimental story about childhood illness. Um, and again, that's really clever. As for character, well, I guess how we initially described the protagonist is quite a cynical sort of creature um, within the space. And then once we reach the story's end, there's the shared humanity that she's denied herself of by being in the arts, or caps. So arts often promotes this idea of connection and connectivity and yet that culture of excellence and achievement can differentiate that away from a greater sense of connectivity with our fellow human beings. Um, as to whether it's a depressing or an inspiring story, I guess that's really up to the reader and that's the sign of a pretty great story too is that there's a duality or a multiplicity of meaning um, when the story's finally finished. A good story gets you talking and has various people presenting various viewpoints on why it's great and what it does well. Um, as for sensory data, there's a bunch throughout the story that I won't bog you down with right now, but I'd encourage you to sort of take them in. And one thing you will note with Moore's descriptions is that her sensory descriptions are strikingly original. So if when one is trying to describe a phenomena or a character, if a default setting comes in and you think, someone has said this before or it's been described this way before you need to stretch and find a different way to describe it so otherwise you run the risk of your descriptive data being cliched and cliched is really just a sort of a it's like a full stop for emotional connection for your reader they'll start switching off and so we want to retain our originality we want to do something different on the page i'd argue it couldn't be much shorter and that there weren't many particularly unnecessary phrases throughout um, dance in America, I guess this is what happens when one revises and edits and works a story um, to its final conclusion, so to speak. So it's not that a great short story is black and white or that it tells a story and closes things out for us. If anything, short story is the space of reflection and analysis, so it's okay to sort of explore a subject. So. Uh, another writer put it thus one time where they said um, we don't necessarily need to know the answer by the end of a story but we need to have asked the right question about it. So how do we write a great short story? Well we show and we don't tell. Um, as mentioned the beginning of the story should hook in your reader and you should start when the action of the story starts. Your ending should be surprising but it should also in some ways on reflection feel inevitable. And that's the paradox of a good ending. And if you feel that you haven't got a great ending yet, then it's likely your story needs more development. As mentioned, after a first, second or a third draft, leave it for a couple of weeks at least, and then revisit it with fresh eyes. Ensure you're writing in all of the five senses. Um, and I guess the thing we don't talk about so much is being prepared to feel vulnerable or uncomfortable or conflicted when writing a great story. The reason why that happens is it signals you're getting closer to a difficult um, emotional truth and that is really where the seeds of some great fiction comes from. Um, be prepared to kill your darlings, this is part of the process. If the drafting process is one of great unconditional space and creation, then the revising process is a meticulous analytical space and it's ruthless and necessarily brutal. Um, but most importantly, take, take risks on the page. Well, while it's important to execute, there's also a lot to be said for the velocity of someone coming up with a really cool idea and running with it in the short form. So in addition to that risk, great short fiction is as much about coherence and cohesiveness, tight prose and your character's motivation as it is about whistles and bells or flowery language. Um, 
so in writing your stories I'd encourage you to really step into that space and rather than being the third person writer to really try and understand your characters to sit with them and dig deep as to what's really bothering the character um, the day-to-day -day life is quite a superficial space writing by contrast is one where we can get deeper and more complex um, uh, there's some more further reading which I'll provide as a link uh, in the video as well and in terms of a lot of books I've read over my time and <laughs> you're welcome to cherry pick those as opposed to reading them all uh, and obviously as a creative writing teacher and manuscript assessor um, I assess short stories, I mentor writers and provide manuscript development as part of my services for more information you can head to my website um, and obviously here we're talking about this Armadale Writers Award so if this is your first time submitting, I'd encourage you to set this as a goal, to take the time, work through the workshops that have been available online, and to just see what you come up with. If you sit down at the page, uh, I wish you all the courage in the world, I wish you all the luck in the world, and I hope you create something truly special for this year's competition. Thank you.